Right, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm really excited to welcome you this morning. I can see that you're so numerous this morning in the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie. It's a great pleasure to have the stakeholders dealing with childhood and culture in this institution that developed uh, a, a, a real feeling for young ones. The Cité des Sciences and Industry, uh, uh, it's no news, has been committed in childhood for more than 30 years. And tw in 2023, the Cité des Enfants de Childs, Cité, uh, had more than uh, 830,000 visitors. It's more than the population in Lyon and a bit less than Marseille. Uh, it was created 31 years ago, and the uh, Cité des Enfants is dedicated to a favoring childhood development and proposes a new discovery of the world through experimentations while adapting to uh, uh, people, children 7 to 12, 12 to 15, and more than that. We'll come back to that. In 2018, we launched a new program called uh, Curious People with uh, temporary exhibits, um, contraries, fragile, metamorphosis, and uh, 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 dancing in July. And this is a new testimony of our commitment to childhood. So these exhibitions enabled us to um, um, uh, develop new cinematography um, language, a new cinematography language dedicated to young ones. We uh, work closely with scientists, with the young audience that is visiting our premises. So all these new uh, uh, initiatives enriched our vocabulary, our palette, and uh, is now helping us to uh, look forward with the cat uh, that is our emblem still looking at us. So I want to talk about the uh, renovation, the, the complete refurbishing of the Cité des Anciens. So we will do this because this building is aged since it was created. We developed new equipment and some equipment were developed thanks to your help and uh, we're uh, changing, refurbishing because everything uh, is is going well now and we thought that it was the right time to develop a new Cité des Enfants. The, the works will start in July and we'll start with the Cité des Grands, the big one city, and then uh, next year we'll begin the Cité for the small ones. During these two years uh, of refurbishing, we will keep one of the city uh, open and we'll develop an alternative offer uh, combining exhibitions, mediations, and events. Because since 2022, uh, we offer, we've, we have a big event for, chil for children in December. So we will, uh, we have developed the Babies Cité, city. Um, and I would like also to mention the new children's gallery uh, designed by the uh, Gallery of Discoveries with the Grand Palais. And this will open in June 2025. And this is dedicated to children from 2 to 10. And it will open with this new exhibit, uh, on transparency and is a, a combination of arts and science. So uh, the idea of culture in the development of children was of course very natural and uh, it's, it's not a way to get there but it's a way of going there. And uh, it's based on our everyday experiences and the discoveries of everyone uh, who uh, take an interest in these topics. So this symposium is uh, giving the floor to professionals working in uh, museums, in people working in, in living uh, uh, theater, in the world of uh, young ones, in, uh, in the artist world. And we will develop new cultural offers dedicated uh, to children. So these uh, exchanges will happen during two days, first day is today. Uh, it will start just now with a presentation from David Le Breton, a sociology professor in the Strasbourg University and a member of the uh, Université de France on uh, risk 
and the relationship between uh, our uh, uh, understanding of risk and learning. And then this afternoon we'll talk about um, the uh, way children uh, play and then tomorrow we'll, we'll think about, we'll talk about how children play. Of course, I want to mention our partners, L'Ecole des Loisirs and the Universion's team that has organized this event. I want to uh, say their names, Flora Bejeger, Margot Coic, Elisa Fay, and Lisa Fay, sorry. And I want to wish you a very good symposium. And I want to quote a few lines from Jacques Brel. A child is the last poet of a world that is trying to uh, grow old. And it's asking, and a child is asking if the, uh, world, the sky has wings. And a child is uh, uh, thinking that there's no fairies anymore in this world. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're going to spend two days together talking about uh, children and culture. My name is Brune Botero. Some information so that everything goes well. First of all, this colloquium is an international conference. You will uh, be able to hear people speaking in French and in English. So if you don't, if you don't feel comfortable with both languages, you can grab a headset at the entrance so that you can listen to the interpretation. There's Wi-Fi as well. The name of the network, Faire Grandir Les Enfants, and the password FGE, capital letters, at 2024. And we'll start by welcoming David Le Breton, who can join me on stage. Bonjour, David. Alors, David. Good morning, David Le Breton. You are a professor of sociology at the University of Strasbourg. You work on um, teenagers' sufferings. Uh, you have written several books, uh, such as uh, Faces and Anthro Anthropology, and uh, Risky Behaviors, Death Games to uh, Life Games, published at the PUF. You can find those books at the library. Great, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to the organizers, Brun, Lisa, Margot, and of course, thank you everyone for uh, being with us this morning and, and listening to my presentation. So first of all, I would like to say that uh, traditional societies give uh, children very, dif very different leeway depending on their culture and their environment. And I want uh, to uh, give the example of Jared Diamond, who's an American anthropologist who has reflected uh, on this issue and is observing in New Guinea society where children are uh, crushed by obligations and controls. And uh, within this society, a, a, a child will uh, will go to an, another family uh, quite close, a few kilometers away. And here is a, a just a, a, a contrary example. The child is left to themselves. There's no control for uh, uh, from adults. And uh, Diamond observes that uh, uh, children play with the fire, with fire, without any adults trying to prevent them. And they see that, uh, that these adults are, are marked by uh, as cars. So this is a very different way of uh, educating children and preparing them to risk. Um, these are also ways of educating children that are uh, not very well seen by our societies. Uh, it's one on one way it would be laissez faire, or it would be a f fussy attention, and most of the time we're just standing in 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 the middle. Some uh, societies. Uh, consider the environment as dangerous, and so they have very close attention from adults. So, for example, in the uh, Amazon rainforest, I, I want to give the example of the uh, Ayaki uh, uh, Indians. They don't leave children uh, alone in the forest because they would be injured by uh, snakes or, or other animals, and so they're uh, carried around on the backs of the um, fathers and, sis and mothers, and they start uh, uh, exploring their environment from the age of five or six because the uh, dangers from uh, because of the dangers from this environment. So this is, generally speaking, to uh, 
remind you that there's not one way of educating children. And, uh, the, and uh, but of course, the world is only made up of bodies and uh, therefore only of the senses through the incessant flow that passes through the individual and translates the uh, multiple data of this environment into smells, sounds, images, tastes, uh, tactile sensations, etc. So the experience of the world is effective and sensory. There's nothing in, in the mind that has not first passed through the senses by a social and cultural condition, a gender, a personal history, an attention to the environment, and uh, most of all, what each individual does with uh, these influences because we're the result of what we do, what we make of our culture and uh, our influences. So children begin to integrate this signifying sensory and effective plurality of the world. Um, what, what they learn at this age is a matrix of meanings and perceptions that will nourish their uh, entire existence. So this early learning combines that of the family or school and is sometimes extended by affinities with neighbors or organizers who passionately pass on their expertise in a particular field. So a child will uh, be fascinated by stars or trees or mushrooms, you name them, for the rest of their life. So this is a participatory approach uh, that teaches how to uh, uh, develop the uh, child's experience. And they open their body in the confrontation with nature rather than, rather than from a distance sitting passively on the school benches or uh, looking at their screens. So ways of knowing call on the child's physical and moral resources. And to my mind, distinguishing these two terms is just a linguistic effect. Because we don't have the morale on the one side and our bodies on the other, on the other side. We're just a combination of both. So the, the child is not a receptacle, but the co-author of his or her education with, of course, adults, and, and, I'm, and I'm putting it in inverted commas because this is a very vague notion to me, but with, uh, so the child is the co-author of his or her education with teachers who are also uh, fellow travelers. It's not reality that individuals perceive, but a world of meanings, and this is why we, uh, we do soci sociology. Uh, it's uh, it's not a, a, a reality that we perceive, but a world of meaning. So one of the tasks of education is to provide children with the tools they need to decipher the world, reminding them of this abundance, the tireless moving of meanings, the multitude of possible points of view, the points of references, of reference they need to understand and explore. Children are no less bodies than their parents, and their understanding and use of the world derive from the attention they receive and the learning they receive. School often entails long periods of immobility that is not age appropriate. And a discipline that, while necessary to the group dynamics of the class, is often difficult to maintain. Hence the fact that some children are restless or distracted uh, as they say, uh, and this is exactly my case. I was told all my childhood that I was distracted and uh, I was punished very often. I had to go around the courtyard uh, because uh, I was a, a very bad um, schoolboy. So the outside the serious spirituality of classroom teaching the constraint of immobility must be interrupted by games physical exercises and activities to discover the environment that encourage expenditure the release of tension and a different relationship to the world and to others the child is then uh, grasped as a person and not uh, uh, and in so far as his, his own body and not just a spiritual 
receptacle to be filled. So they rediscover the sensoriality of the world, the desire to touch trees and stones, flowers and plants, to feel the earth, to hear silence again, to look uh, at and contemplate the world around them and no longer simply see it for utilitarian reasons, for self-protection or si on sidewalks or in the streets. So walks in the forest, for example, to identify trees, plants, animals, gardening or maritime activities for school children close to the sea are all wonderful escapes into other dimensions of existence that cannot be learned from books. Children make the world their own through their bodies, learning to interpret situations and to protect themselves. They discover to help each other, how to help each other, and to develop their uh, motor skills and uh, their knowledge of the uh, outside world. Some teachers also introduce into their classes exercises in silence, meditation, and yoga movements, which, were, which are absolutely conducive to calming the child, making him or her more available for other lessons and unifying the class group but they also teach the child to listen to and understand his or her sensory perceptions, thereby broadening his or her knowledge to, of the world. So for the teacher, there's also a time to, it's also a time for them to breathe. So reintroducing the body dimension into the uh, learning experience is a way of taking the child as a person and no longer as a pure mind. And given the physical inertia of many children and teenagers nowadays, their health-promoting activities, to, because they look at their screens all the time, so the, the mere fact of helping them uh, uh, move is, is, some, is very good. Um, I'm not totally fascinated by that, but in terms of public health, I think it's something to encourage and promote. Um, if we uh, look at all the health issues that our, our children are faced with. Now I'm talking, I'm thinking about uh, theaters, uh, film. So all these uh, uh, cultural activities is a way of helping them uh, get out of uh, their screens, so to speak, and um, making them understand that the, the world is much more complex than what they see on their screens. So teaching varies according to the moral status of the body in society, according to social conditions, uh, according to whether classes are mixed or single sex, according to the representations inherent in gender. That's, that seems to, to be very much the case still today. So the resources allocated to establishment, the inventiveness of teams, the personalities of teachers, and the quality of their mutual exchanges, uh, the open-mindedness of authorities, the particular creativity of each teacher, crystallize the receptiveness of pupils, their collaboration conducive to the learning actions implemented. These um, different physical registers, uh, these activities are perceived as uh, potentially dangerous and highly regulated in that they require students to go outside the school walls um, just to visit gardens or go around for an hour or two in the forest. So you have to uh, leave the school. And so here a number of issues uh, appear, insurance, to, uh, related issues or, or parents who feared that an accident might happen and there's uh, uh, the number of uh, insurance companies uh, acting there in, in schools but also in uh, other fields. And the uh, social workers that I meet very often uh, feel stuck and they cannot uh, offer activities that they feel would be uh, appropriate. Our contemporary societies are haunted by risk because they're societies of individuals. Uh, we talk about each individual t talks about in their own name, and we're no longer in connection with other individuals. Um, of course, we might find uh, things that uh, lead us together uh, from time to time, but most of the time, it's 
a society which is very much based on the individual and feel alone in the world. And so these uh, uh, societies are societies of individuals who feel helpless in the face of the threats they imagine around them. They live in autonomy with relative indifference to others. And uh, while this feeling is conducive to self-development, they nevertheless feel isolated and fragile. So the individualism is leading to freedom with a, uh, whereas uh, New Guinea societies are society based on the uh, uh, we, on the together. So each person only exists um, because of their interactions with the others, whereas we exist in our uh, Western societies as individuals, but also, you, but, but then you have to, to pay the price and uh, sometimes feel very alone, very fragile, etc., etc. So individuals in our contemporary societies don't uh, feel confident, and that would give them greater self-confidence. So, of course, their sense of danger is never proportional to the real threats. Uh, fantasy or imagination plays a major role both in denying threats and in exaggerating them. Security can never be guaranteed because fears are constantly shifting, giving rise to new demands for protection. In any case, it's impossible to uh, make a child's existence so secure that it no longer involves uncertainties and dangers. Uh, live is, is a constant danger it's, well, or a precarious state. Even though in, in our uh, society, Western societies, we are quite protected, but uh, I have developed in, in one of my books uh, the fact that each decision is risky. Coming here uh, rather than, than go somewhere else is, of course, the risk of being bored, but also uh, the risk of uh, being hit by a car or being an accident or, or missing something that might be important. So this is quite simple, but deciding to study in one city rather than another, deciding to s uh, study sociology rather than physics, or, or not studying at all, live with someone, uh, carry a child, well, all of this is, uh, is, is risk. One great sociologist was saying that the bigger risk, biggest risk in one's lifetime was to, uh, to have a child, to give birth to a child. But uh, each risk is uh, connected to um, threats and uh, dangers, and our lives are just unpredictable um, um, and much more unpredictable than uh, expected. So we have to uh, take responsibility for our freedom, freedom as individuals. In the first years of life, uh, children are vulnerable to the dangers. Uh, if you leave a six month year old uh, a six month old baby they uh, they alone and with no care they they immediately die and so um, Victor de la Veron uh, was a, a six seven year old boy uh, who was, uh, grew up alone and he knew what to eat etc but uh, but most of the ch children uh, until then are very vulnerable. And when they start to uh, walk around two and a half years, they are confronted to new learning experiences. Uh, they're confronted to uh, poisoning, electrocution, burns, falls, uh, drowning if there's a, a, a river or, or a swimming pool. Of course, the uh, risks of accident in, in roads. So. This is uh, the moment when parents are very uh, careful to teach their children how to uh, pay attention to the world around them. So, so the, the the children teach the parents teach the children how to pay attention to the environment. So, opening up to others and to the world is a risky business, but these risks. Uh, help the, to build the child's self, depending on the situation. Education calls for the right balance between uh, supervision and trust. You can't 
always look and, and watch what children do uh, and you can't always trust them so parents have to uh, have the right intuition that uh, children don't take too uh, too too many risks but of course it depends on each family uh, several obstacles stand in the way of a comprehensive childhood education, the, the early individualization of children who often become full partners in family decisions and activities. They're no longer the children of, uh, of before, and I'm only t thinking about uh, 30 years ago, uh, subject to the authority of parents and teachers. Today, often supported by their parents, they reject any form of authority that is not in line uh, with their own wishes. They only think about their own desires and they don't want anyone preventing their wishes. So the child is already someone. Remember uh, the very beautiful film by Robert Martino, The Child is a Person. And so the uh, this idea of considering a child as a person uh, and responsible for their actions. So the contemporary family is no longer always the mediating instance for entry into a social bond based on sharing and limits. It has often become privatized, um, as have children, and has become an aggregation of individuals, even children, fiercely defending their autonomy. I have the right to do this and that. As, and, and families, uh, as far as children are concerned, it's a sore of narcissism, of a refusal, refusal to deal with others, and even at school or in other areas where the group is necessary. But allowing children to believe that they are alone and in control of their own activities encourages them to see the world uh, structured solely from their own point of view. And uh, that makes them uh, incapable of accepting uh, otherness around them. And yet, uh, children uh, grow up in this, uh, in, in this, in the world, and many uh, studies today show that empathy is diminishing because of the major, the massive use of smartphones, the fact that the other uh, is no longer uh, close but uh, at a distance because we don't see the uh, face anymore and uh, the physical body. And there's a, a great number of studies that have been carried out and uh, that show that children are much less empathic uh, today than they used to be. And I call empathy the ability to uh, stand in someone else's shoes. And sometimes they don't even realize, on um, because of the smartphones, that uh, children don't realize that they are destroying someone's life. And and I think that uh, nowadays we have we are l much less capable of of. Uh, feeling the other person's feelings and um, standing in their shoes. Uh, as adults, we have usually uh, uh, acquired this ability, but we realize that it, this is more, more and more difficult to, uh, to do it with children nowadays. So today's children are sedentary, fascinated by screens, and more often than not immobile. Uh, physically immobile with uh, their mind going around in, 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 and with, with uh, taken by the, the great number of text messages uh, that they send and receive and so they uh, become more nervous, they have uh, much less ability to focus, uh, everything that has been said by psychologists. So children are immobile. Uh, bearing witness in their own way to the seated humanity, as I call it, that characterizes our societies today. In 2007, a British doctor noted the progressive restriction of children's walking routes. In 1919, a child was walking alone to a lake uh, some 10 kilometers away. One generation later, in 1950, 
the distance was reduced to 1.5 kilometers. By uh, 1979, the child was walking alone to the swimming pool 800 meters away. Today, they're not, they're only allowed to walk to the end of the street 300 meters away. So this is uh, uh, what happens for children today. Today, they're only allowed to walk to the end of the street. Only 11% of primary school children go to school alone, 11% only. So that explains uh, the, the traffic jams uh, near schools at uh, school times. And we know that the 800-meter uh, race in 1969, no, sorry, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, children would uh, uh, do this race in three minutes, and today it's they it takes them four minutes. So we've lost one minute. So this is uh, really related to the uh, health issues. And uh, the, the, this is uh, okay. The children have become kings, tyrants. They're small. They need protection, but at the same time, they're uh, all powerful. And we consider that the uh, uh, children uh, take too many risks. And so there's uh, a number of legal restrictions that have been set in place. So judicializing has. Uh, uh, tied the hands of educators that are worried about any incident and having the pay to pay for the, the price for the unforeseeable. Uh, if I take my own example, the world of my childhood has nothing in common with what is happening today in primary school. I walk to school several kilometers away and I spend my childhood roaming the roads on my bike. Um, Running, walking, I was swimming in, in all the nearby rivers and lakes that were around us. Uh, our, our parents trusted us, and no one forbid us anything. And uh, my mom, I remember, really insisted that we learned how to uh, swim very early, at a very early age, because uh, we were close to the Loire River, and uh, everyone was doing that, all my neighbors we're doing this as well, and so when we're f four, five, six, we just knew very well how to swim. And uh, our parents were trusting us. And uh, talking about culture in uh, uh, larger understanding, I was uh, going to the public library uh, or the library of, of my father's uh, plant, uh, Renault, uh, car industry plant. And so I would take two, three discs and a few books, and I would walk there a few kilometers away and uh, coming back home. And uh, my parents never worried about this. So this is uh, also uh, something that uh, Robert Messner has observed is one of the great mountaineering uh, person in mountaineering history. Is uh, from Austria, from Tyrol, and he remembers the uh, mountain world of his childhood. So I'm quoting him. We didn't know any prohibition signs then, and we didn't have a swimming pool. On the other hand, we could enjoy the Vilnius torrent where we built dams. It's true that uh, urban culture has taken all responsibility away from people. We have insurance for everything we own and everything we do, so that if anything goes wrong, others will be responsible. So there's the paradox of uh, contemporary world that individualizes children from the earliest age while maintaining their status as minors. So this is exactly what Messner was saying about his childhood and what I'm saying about my childhood. So quoting Messner again, um, those spaces of freedom and pluralism of values that were natural in my childhood have disappeared, writes Messner. Today, ponds have to be fenced in. It's forbidden to cross fences. The forest is taboo. And even when climbing, it's feared that people will complain in the event of an accident. If you read Messner's book, 
uh, see that uh, when they were eight, nine with his brother, they would climb the, the rocks and all the mountains, run him in the Alps and his uh, parents uh, didn't feel worry whatsoever and they really trusted their children. Many activities that were uh, once commonplace in childhood are now associated with risk as a result of the process of insurancialization in our societies, uh, which identifies possible threats in a multitude of activities that previously posed little problem. And so there's a number of regulations. Accidents are no longer seen as the result of chance or, uh, or of the event itself, but of carelessness or personal or technical failure. So if I fall down the, 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 in the stairs of the Cité des Sciences, maybe someone would uh, sue the uh, Mairie de Paris for not taking the right action. And so we're looking for responsible people. And uh, today's society is multiplying the notion, the uh, understanding of, of, of the notion of risks because we can be uh, held responsible for something that uh, we didn't suspect. So uh, too much preoccupation with safety destroys the child's potential, potential to expand his physical and moral resources and limits his creativity. A preoccupation with safety in physical activities hinders children's development and makes them much more vulnerable to accidents because they're not unprepared. And as they uh, keep looking at their screens all day long, they don't have the physical resources of uh, 30, 40 years back. Remember what I was telling you just now about the, uh, the uh, 800 meter race. We've lost one minute in that race. So confronting risk um, encourages initiative, self-questioning a renewed relationship with the world, the desire to experimentation. And um, the more we overprotect children, the more fearful and vulnerable uh, they will be seeking the protection of others. And let me uh, uh, quote or talk about uh, Zola. Let's go back 120 years back uh, in his novel Paris. And so it's, this is the beginning of the bicycle era. And Marie is a young woman, and is um, that's her emancipation with uh, the use of bicycle. Bicycles were uh, very useful for women to emancipate at the end of the 19th century. And Zola uh, really enjoyed uh, riding bicycles, and so uh, he was promoting bicycles as uh, a, a tool uh, for emancipation for young women and, and, and little girls. And so there's uh, a dialogue here between this young woman on her bicycle and a friend and the, as they're riding their bicycle on, on the path. And there's no cars, of course. And the, uh, the woman says that, OK, the first thing she would do if she had a, a, a little girl is to teach her how to ride a bicycle. So I'm quoting Zola now, put a very young put a very young girl on a bicycle and, and let her loose on the roads. She'll have to open her eyes to avoid, avoid stones, uh, to turn in the right direction when a bend comes up. So those who will avoid stones, who turn in the right direction on the roads, will also know how to overcome difficulties in social and sentimental life, to take the best course with an open, honest, and solid intelligence. And uh, this young woman is, uh, uh, she's, she's listing all the progress already made thanks to the bicycle, the breeches that free the legs. Remember that uh, uh, young women had to uh, wear skirts and a number of them as well. And so they, uh, f that's riding a bicycle, that's when they started uh, uh, wearing breeches. The breeches that free the legs, uh, joint outings that mix and equalize, equalize the sexes. 
the wife and children who follow the husband everywhere, comrades, like the two of us, because she was with a friend uh, riding their bicycles in the countryside, uh, comrade, comrades like the two of us who can ride through fields and woods without anyone being surprised. And uh, the bath in air and light we take in the middle of nature, this return to our common mother, the earth, and the new strength and gaiety we draw from it. So this is the end of uh, this quote by Zola. Um, so this is an, a way of opening up to the world, uh, uh, teaching us how to uh, get by and uh, find out the dangers in the environment. I'll try and, and go a bit uh, quicker. I've already said quite a lot of things. I wanted to conclude uh, my presentation differently, so I'm going to try and skip a few paragraphs to have enough time to mention this. A couple of anecdotes that I want to tell you about. A reminder uh, of one of them, the fact that today our children know more than a hundred logos, thousands of logos, but they are incapable of uh, recognizing an oak from a birch tree, uh, identifying birds that they can listen to every morning. That's a paradox. How our minds are formatted, how we um, don't know well the environment that surrounds us, the fact that we don't have the right terms, that children don't know the terms. They're not being taught about it anymore, but uh, we teach them how to use their smartphone, smartphones in a, an effective way, an indie way. They are prevented from uh, having this uh, sensorial relationship with the surrounding world. Lots of studies have been written on the fact that uh, outdoor activities are allowing children to develop a, a happy relationship with the world. They learn about uh, mutual help, solidarity. It's teaching them that there are points of view than theirs, that they're not just a, a king in the world, that there are different playground areas, different points of views. Those are powerful moments where um, they're open to other people to otherness, the fact that uh, you play with, with risks, the fantasy of risk, that's a very good education for children, um, the intensity of it, how children think that they are taking risks, that are, they are putting themselves in dangers, but actually um, that's not the case, especially when adults are around, but there's this feeling that extraordinary for children, and there's a very simple example of a, a small, uh, of a teenage girl who's 15, 16 years old. She has issues with um, uh, legal issues. And uh, so the judge gives her the choice to either go to a facility where they welcome uh, teenagers with issues or a prison. And uh, there's an association that exists, Seuil, that was uh, founded by Bernard Olivier. And this uh, teenage uh, girl decides to walk uh, a 2,000 kilometer route without a smartphone, without music. So they go with a companion. They go from uh, puy en volet And then halfway through, they stop in a refuge uh, with uh, other hikers, uh, French hikers, they all uh, speak, uh, exchange, and someone uh, turns to her and says, well, you seem very young. Where do you come from? And the young girl says, well, we started in puy en volet and all the adults are uh, amazed. They say, well, you walked uh, so many kilometers. And the, the young teenage girls feels a sense of wonder, the feeling that for the first time in her life, she's someone, she's done something great. And so you see how sometimes uh, you need something very small to change a life, but you had to, to take the risk of taking this teenage girl on those routes on 2,000 kilometers so that she can open herself to the outside world and uh, get rid of all the social, uh, emotional, uh, family responsibilities that... Uh, she might uh, felt on her shoulders. Risks 
are an identity resource, when there's a, a, a potential game with uh, uh, resources, sometimes it's a way of experimenting oneself. Sometimes there's an over uh, assessment of one's resources, but that's part of the game. Sometimes that's how you learn how to be slow when uh, you are riding a bike, uh, not go at full speed. Sometimes uh, that might seem obvious for an adult, but not always for a child. And that's by experimenting these that they can adjust then their behaviors. I talked a lot about physical activities, outdoor activities to show you that they are major forms of education, of repair. In many cases, I'm not going to be able to talk about how social workers are using uh, uh, ad adventure activities, long walks, walking through a desert, climbing, mountaineering, all types of activities that are used today, or in Brittany, for instance, uh, cru cruises are organized for uh, drug addicts, uh, teenagers who are uh, going on a cruise for several weeks and uh, uh, helping sailors. And this is a major resource today, especially in today's world where we are more and more immobile and uh, we are owned by the GAFAM, the internet. Uh, giants that are thinking for us and ruling the world that is surrounding us. But I'd like to conclude by talking about my experience of risky behaviors um, for young people. Beyond physical activities that I mentioned and the feeling of adventure, you can also turn to cultural activities in a more traditional meaning. I'd like to quote some examples. You can watch a beautiful film from Keshish called The Esquive. In this film, a French teacher in the north of France tries to put together a play from Marivaux with uh, her students. They're from uh, underprivileged backgrounds. And uh, when they talk to each other, they speak at full speed. It's very tricky to understand what they're saying. It's a type of language that is a bit like a, a firearm, there's, a, there's no breathing, uh, whether they're girls or boys speaking, they have the same way of speaking. But when they start reading Marivaux's text, something happens, something magical. They're all listening to the person who's reading the text. They're rediscovering their own language. And beyond this, it's also a rediscovery of the world the feeling that it's not just one way of speaking, the way you've heard in your neighborhood, there are different ways of speaking. And uh, th theater is a anthropological uh, setting that is helping us um, changing our social role, that we're never trapped in our social reputation. So the teacher can say to a student, you could be this and that character. and the child is going to change role and they realize that they are never uh, never the prisoners of themselves there's a world outside and to me theater is an essential tool learning tool and a way for people to understand that they have leeway in their own lives I'll be brief uh, beautiful experience from Pina Bosch, one of the greatest choreographer of the 20th century in Wuppertal in Germany in a secondary school. So she is uh, invited by uh, the municipalities to organize a dance activity workshop with teachers, with the students. And for several months, the students are going to create or dance a, uh, a legendary choreography from Pino Bush and use their own means to do it. Half of the students are from Turkey. And it's not always easy to involve boys because for boys, dance, theater is for homosexuals. I say it in 
uh, terms that are not as rude as what they're using, but just remember the beautiful film, Billy Elliot, and the violence that uh, he's suffering for uh, wanting to be a dancer from his own family who are com fr coming from a working class uh, background and uh, from the other pupils at school. So a bunch of uh, kids, uh, of uh, children, half of them are boys, the other half are girls, and they are going to produce a performance that is going to be filmed by a director. It's called The Dancing Dreams. You can... Uh, purchased the DVD, I bought it for 10 euros approximately. It's a beautiful documentary. And it's uh, it's extremely moving because you realize progressively along the interviews that uh, the uh, director has with different children that many children were able to face some wounds that uh, they uh, we're experiencing and I think one of the most beautiful testimonies a, a teenage girl who's 14 15 years old and Pina Bush offers her to dance solo it's a wonderful moment for her and the viewers the the parents quite often are going to be able to appreciate the the result of those uh, months and when she's interviewed we realize that uh, her father killed himself a short time before the start of this workshop. The family was um, puzzled. They never understood why the father made this decision. The mother was uh, falling in depression, and she chose dancing to face the situation. And then there's this moment in the film when um, she says that when I when I dance this uh, solo uh, number, this uh, solo dance, I was convinced that my father was uh, watching me. I talked about the physical risk, and there's also a more symbolic risk taking uh, the floor in front of an audience. Uh, for me, it was something impossible for a long time, and uh, for children to be able to dance in front of others, to uh, play at the theater, uh, to uh, have to face the potential situation of uh, forgetting your words. And there's something that is prodigious that is happening when you enter a stage. These are essential types of learning. To conclude, I'd like to talk about walking again. I talked about the Say Association experience, but it's something that uh, exists in many European countries. You have children. Uh, who walk on a 2,000 kilometer route without a smartphone, with, without any device. You can also have them walk on a shortened distance, uh, take them outside of the city, walk around a neighborhood, visit the neighboring forest with uh, experts, uh, moderators who know about trees, and you teach children how to identify leaves, trees, extremely simple but often it's going to require from uh, teachers social workers many inner resources it should be relentless as well because people are going to tell them that it's dangerous if someone falls if someone if a child disappears you'll never get over it so you have to fight this to fight this society where there's an obsession for safety on one hand and when you switch on TV you also see races that are going through cities, the Paris Dakar race for instance, uh, sad memories attached to it. So you have the on one hand uh, the taste for risks for adventure and on the other hand this obsession for safety which means that our uh, room for, much, for freedom is very restricted. So just to conclude by saying that risk is an inherent part of our lives, we can't live without taking risks, and we learn a lot from all the risks that we're taking. It's a way of growing throughout our lives. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Merci. 
Merci. Thank you, David Le Breton. We're going to take some questions from the audience, but before this, would like we're going to talk about children for today. So children are at the heart of our presentations, our exchanges, but there are no children around, neither on stage or in the audience. So we've interviewed three children. They are our guests, and they will take the floor from time to time during this conference. So first question from Louise, the young Louise. My name is Louise, I'm 10 years old. I like reading and I like doing nothing as well. So my question, why do we always need parents? Why do you always need to listen to them? Why shouldn't we just listen to ourselves? Shall I answer now? You can answer, Louise. We will uh, pass on your answer. Well, I'd say that the way children are watching over a child is called transmission. When you're 10 years old, you still uh, have a lot to learn from the world, even if uh, you love reading, like, uh, like her, even if you like doing nothing. And today, you have to value this. It's extraordinary what she says, because usually boredom doesn't exist for children you you spend 10 15 seconds doing nothing and then you take out your smartphone and um uh, when you listen to child psychiatrists psychologists you read a lot about how you must value boredom because when you're bored you are uh, stimulating your imagination, your creativity, and so you also have to make a difference between authority and uh, authoritarianism when uh, there is too much uh, authority can, or parents are authoritarian, then children are prevented from walking one way, doing one thing, but when you are using authority, then children are understanding that their parents are not wrong about prohibiting such and such activity. So you can make a difference between authoritarianism and authority and uh, use the prohibition word. So when you are forbidding things, that's authoritarianism. And when you're using authority is it's a way of uh, an exchange of uh, talking to each other. If I do this, it's because that's dangerous. And you're discussing with the child when you're using authoritarianism, then you are just forbidding children to do something. I forgot to uh, talk about two representations, and uh, I forgot to talk about it in my introduction. Remember in the Arashka from Boris Vian, the, uh, this mother who's so scared that something's going to happen to her children that she puts them in a cage. And of course, they'll slowly die from it. And another image that I wanted to mention, Ettore's Colas film, it's called uh, Ugly, Dirty and Mean. You remember in an uh, Italian city and in an underprivileged district. We can hear Lauren in the microphone. <laughs> um, so, Ettore Scola, remember that in, in this I village in Italy, there's a very large cage made of wood. And every morning, from the start of the film, we see a young teenage girl who's 13, 14 years old, and she fetches all the kids from the, the, the slums, and they all go inside the cage. And we see children that are playing with each other, that are climbing. And then we realize that the young girl is pregnant. She's got a... a we can see her, her belly, and uh, that's the image of a child that is trapped in a highly secured world, and you have to trust children. 
We've got time, five minutes to listen to the audience. If you've got questions, comments. There are two people who are walking around the room with microphones. We've got to switch on the mic, maybe. The microphone is not working and the interpreters cannot hear the question. I don't like when my daughters are doing risky activities like paragliding. But I've learned a lot when I uh, did this on a personal basis, so it wouldn't be very smart from me, from me to forbid them to do them, just for my own personal comfort. Good morning, thank you for your presentation. I'm not sure it's a question, something I'm wondering. I think I'm a bit younger than you without uh, offending you. When you're talking about your childhood, I feel like that's of practices are about being autonomous and I feel that it was quite a global uh, comment that blame the empowerment of children and sometimes you you have to think about an urban context a rural context and you're you're just being autonomous because there's no choice because you 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 can't uh, accompany your your children to school and maybe you don't have a car or so I felt like maybe it was ba very harsh the way you were uh, blaming children and how they use screens and I think I'm part of the uh, children who have grown up and uh, started using uh, uh, smartphones, but I've uh, gone to school and I've uh, gone on hikes. I've grown up in a rural area, maybe that's why, but I feel that uh, your description was a bit harsh. Maybe a short answer. Of course, uh, I wasn't trying to... Uh, to blame anyone, it's, it's, I try to describe current situations that are being analyzed by uh, sociologists, by anthropologists like myself, who are not fascinated by technologies and are trying to analyze their impact in terms of knowledge of sociability. So um, I feel, I observe that uh, a whole generation has disappeared under our eyes, a generation of children, of teenagers, but it's not just the case in Paris or in Strabag, that's the case all around the world because everyone is obsessed by uh, one's phone and so when you're looking for your for a direction, you don't know who to turn to and I feel like that's a disorientation of the world today. No one is guiding us, no one is helping us, no one is showing us the way. Another uh, one, last rural uh, representation. I quite often go to Lorraine in a small village, and then when I go on hikes, on a when it's two o'clock, I see that there's a group of teenagers who are on their smartphones, and when I come back two hours later, they're still there. They haven't moved when uh, their parents. Uh, in their childhood would uh, walk around the the paths in the forest looking for mushrooms etc so 
it's a bit difficult to, to be brief and simple in my answer because you're, you're right in saying that children who are growing up with those tools are uh, very used to it. They, they feel very comfortable with this, but they don't know what they're, what they're missing, how they could experience the world if they're not, we're not always using their smartphones when they're in contact with others. We realize that our children have no general culture, no general, general sense of culture. They're ready to believe anything, so they're the great uh, playground for uh, populism, for extremism. So if you, if you tell them the Martians have landed in Paris, they'll hurry up to see what they look like. They've got no distance, they no reflection about this. We're going to explore these issues in other round tables with other speakers. So we're going to continue asking ourselves those questions. I think there was one last question. You can ask your question quickly and then we'll start the next round table. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. I've learned a lot. A question regarding what you said, a description of the world a description of the world we live in. But what I was looking for in your presentation is what can we do about this? When you describe a world where we are losing contact with reality where children are the victim of a capitalist system that is favoring this mindset. What can we do about this? Can a, a person do something at uh, his or her own level? I've got a child, I want to take them and I want to take my child in nature and visit a migrant center. Can I do something at the personal level, at work and at uh, every level of society? Thank you very much. That's the topic of our, of our conference, to combine people's experiences. I think we need to combat minds um, formats to put our our mindsets in uh, specific formats and we are uh, the owners of our existence. Louise was saying that she loved reading, she loved doing nothing as well, so we always have a world ahead of us. That's an, a fundamental sentence that I use when I talk about risky behaviors. The world is not behind us, it's ahead of us. It's up to us to build it. The way parents are going to be creative, how they're going to open their children to the outside world, take them to forest to see a play, a show, uh, make them travel so that children can think about the use of smartphones and not just be obsessed by it. That's always uh, within our hands, under our control. So we don't always have to be complicit with the GAFAM that are controlling the world today, that are more powerful than states and that are refusing to pay their taxes. Just a reminder. So this is not a world that we should promote if we want to fight for public services, solidarity etc. because that's a world that uh, is against our values embodied by men that are favoring ultra-capitalism, ultra-individualism, a world where you can't live if you don't have a lot of money and the big majority of the world can't live in these conditions. Thank you very much, David Le Breton. Thank you very much and have a fruitful conference.